you achieve a state of failure right when things stop working hmm. and things stop working initially with you hmm. because maybe your energy was not managed correctly hmm. i say go what you're saying is basically you have to wake up every day and say i will fail right what there's a, a famous line by some someone said you know the the hardest part about being a boxer is not being fit or being fast the hardest part is the fear of getting hit right all ties back that if you wake up with rest and you're able to control your thoughts and you tell them mm-hmm. you start your day by saying i will do my best i mm-hmm. most likely may fail yeah but as long as i have dusted myself off and i'm ready for tomorrow i'm good to go when you fail enough you realize there is no ego hmm getting comfortable with failing and failing often hmm right because failure is inevitable but failure is not final hello and welcome to the details we're going to go a little off script this time i've had the honor of having the guest in front of me on with me 2 years ago online when we were in covid and now he's here in person my dear friend faraz rana what's happening what's up fazan it's 3 years ago it was 3 years ago 3 and a half years ago. it was episode 20 20 and how many episodes are you on now i think we're at 110 wow that's a yeah 110 it's a milestone you remember where it all began yes <laughs> <laughs> but i'm not going to talk about where it began first okay. i'm going to talk about what you have done in the last 90 episodes yeah which is basically 3 years yeah you went from being part of a company that didn't exit and now you've started your own business and become an entrepreneur you've also done the y combinator funding experience yeah so tell me what it was like going from being part of a startup getting the exit doing nothing then getting into y combinator and becoming your own business owner entrepreneur now in new york city doing nothing is a little harsh i was you know i was traveling i was writing following in your footsteps as i i'm learning i'm learning what it's like to be an entrepreneur You told me that you know an entrepreneur is dirty. It's like so you know nothing until you're an entrepreneur. For us, you don't understand anything about life until you're an entrepreneur. And do you? And now I want to experience it for myself. And what has the experience been like? Uh, it's 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 interesting. It's it's very tough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's, uh, so you used to give me those funny looks and be like, "Yeah, what is this stuff you're doing? I don't get it." Yeah. Now do you get it? I. Um, I get it. Yes, I get it. What do you get? I so I I've learned that um anything you do in life is selling. It's and selling. Yeah. Yeah. And being an entrepreneur entrepreneur is a lot about selling, which I should didn't realize before. But that's stage 2. Yeah. First stage 1 is all up here. Stage 1 is the psychology. So that's, first, so, so stage 1 is yeah. to me is being sold. Right. So you're selling to yourself. Yeah. You have to be sold. If you're not sold you can never do the selling effect yeah yeah there you go you know so you're in your case you were sold on this idea that fintech companies needed compliance regulation i was sold on the idea that i wanted to live the life of a zanse <laughs> <laughs> travels the world does a uh, does does a podcast and <laughs> uh, he interviews all these like amazing people yeah. people are free he's always he is questions. always he was always on the internet he's always posting very very um very profound thoughts on linkedin <laughs> about life i recently discovered books about journey you discovered books as a result of your entrepreneur journey that's true actually you, i you when i realized that i couldn't <laughs> find the right mentors to mentor me i was like wait i've heard of these things called books <laughs> do you do audible or do you actually I read do the do book? audible you do do you do uh do you fast forward like i i listen to audible at 1.5 1.5 i found the ideal speed to be oddly enough 1.4 For me it depends on the dis- depends on the narration. I've done a narration at 1.8 and yeah. it was fine. You can do 1.8. I can I've, and you don't and do do zone when you listen are you zoning out or are you like So I'll do two kinds of listening. I'll do active listening and passive listening. Okay. Active listening is What's the difference? <laughs> so like if I'm going for a run or if I'm sitting let's say on a plane or if I'm sitting like where I just there's nothing else to do but listen, you don't have a choice but mm. you're listening so you get into the active listening mode. Mm. You know? passive listening is like if late at night i just want to go to bed you know and i find something that i'd been reading i kind of want to take from it but i don't really want to take from it so i just leave it on and as i'm fading out of this positive really 
Yeah. So, would you, and do you multitask? Do you listen to a book and do other things? I've tried that, but you don't retain anything. You don't retain anything, which is why I find Audible very difficult. Because with reading, like you're actually reading a book. You're sitting down, you're reading a book. Um, with Audible, like you feel the need to do something, right? You feel the need to be walking somewhere, doing something, and it becomes very hard to retain anything. So I've tried a lot of books that you... Is the world has come to an amazing place where you're recommending books to me. It's like, Faraz, have you read this? I'm like, yes, Faraz, I've read books before. Who'd but have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Yeah, yeah, but you recommended some good books. Would, um... But the thing is that you have to be doing something mechanical, right? Yeah. Like, so like if you're driving, it's mechanical enough that, you know, you've done, you've done it for so many years that you're not surprised by, and it's not like you're racing on the street. It's very yeah. mechanical. Yeah. Running is mechanical. Sitting on a plane is mechanical. Um, you know, just something like that. Just walking on a treadmill is a mechanical. Right. You know, even I would say doing your weights workout routine is mechanical. Yeah. Anything where your mind is not required yeah. for operation, yeah. the mind is free. Yeah. When the mind is free, it can retain and visualize. Because for me, visualization is extremely important. Yeah. So you're a visual person. So I'm you're a visual person. I have to see the story. When you're reading a book, you're visualizing. Oh, there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole story. Characters, there's, there's, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, wow. You're in a different place altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm outside, <laughs> like, outside, like I was reading Viktor Frankl's book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. That visual was yeah. not a great visual. No, no, that's a very, best. so I have, I have not read that book. Um, I know, I know the premise of the book. Um, you know, I, I think there's a reason why it's considered one of the best books ever written and one of the most meaningful books ever written. I think like people who get into, you know, midlife sort of points in their life want to think about well, what is, how do you, how do you learn to train your brain to not react to things, right? To sort of have control over your thought process in your brain. Um, yeah. I think there are two ways to do it. One is uh, thorough, thorough practice and discipline. And then the other is drugs. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, the second is what most people do. That's why people do different drugs, right? And this is both pharmaceutical and narcotic. I mean, all kinds, right? All right. So well, people, uh, people do herbal. Yeah. Um, people do chemical. Yeah. Um, people find, but you know, I mean, that's what, you know, drugs do. So I, I would, I would, okay, look, the word drugs has a bit of a, <laughs> you know, connotation. Right. You know, um, so instead of using the word drugs, I would say assisted, yeah. unassisted yeah, yeah. management yeah. of response to stimulus. Okay, wow, you're a Mr. Marketing guy. Yeah. I get it. That's <laughs> assisted, <laughs> unassisted. So yeah. unassisted is your ability to create space. Okay. Through meditation, through breath work, and to just not being a dick. Yeah. You know, yeah. just be a good guy and just kind of hold back before you respond. You see a stimulus stuff. Well, that's how he, I mean, I mean, that's easier said than done, right? I mean, the guy wrote, uh, Victor Frankl wrote this book while he was in, you know, in, in Auschwitz. Auschwitz. The camps. Yeah. yeah. I mean, being in prison, like your body being in prison. 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 He's like literally in a death camp. Right. Right. It's worse than prison. Right. And to have the mental discipline in that environment is obviously, you know, the peak level of mental discipline. But, you know, I mean, sort of, I assume since you read the book, you would, you would know more, but you know, the idea is that, um, your, your mind is a muscle, like any other muscle in your body. And it's, it's what you do with it. It's what you do with it and it's controllable. So a lot of what people struggle with in, I think generally in life is, um, being subject to their thoughts, right. And being subject to whatever fears, uncertainties you have in your thoughts and you're constantly not living in the present moment because you're thinking about the future or thinking about the past. Um, and being able to control that is um, very difficult, right? Because why, why don't you have fears? Like everyone has fears. Everyone has uh, concerns. Everyone is afraid of the unknown, which is generally the future. And so there's, in that, yeah. as, as from the book was something that really stuck with me is that fear of the future, the unknown, you have uncertainty, yeah. right? So he talks in the book about there was this visual where he spoke about he could tell when one of his fellow prisoners was going to die. Yeah. What they would do is they would all, like they would have a cigarette that they would hide and they'd hold on to and they'd carry. Mm. There'd come a point in a prisoner's uh, sort of journey in that place, in one of those camps, in the concentration camps, where a prisoner would give up. Mm. The mind would give up. Mm. and kind of accept defeat. 
The prisoner would then go on to light a cigarette, that, that cigarette that they were holding on to, smoke that cigarette, and subsequently, uh, Viktor Frankl could tell that this guy is now going to die within the next two to five days. Mm. Perfectly normal living guy suddenly mentally gives up mm. and his life is no longer with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that sat with me. So, I mean, I, because I'm a visual person, I actually saw it, right? Like, mm. see the visual. Mm. That stayed with me. I said, wow. So you're saying that he's saying, mm. to some extent, we actually control our presence here. Mm. We have some control. I mean, we've, we've relegated everything to God and higher power. I get, to, I get that. Mm. But based on what he wrote, is my interpretation of it, mm. is your mind has the ability to hold on to that for as long as possible. Mm. Mm. And you have to develop and exercise that ability. So which means then, if I translate it, if I fall sick, my mind has the ability to heal mm. if I want to heal. Yeah, yeah. If I enter the entrepreneurial journey, this I bring it back to this, mm. my mind is in control of whether I will attain success or not. It might take a little bit longer to attain success, as did Viktor Frankl in the fact that he didn't know that the Germans would be defeated. Yeah. Up until the moment they were defeated. Yeah. But he held on. Yeah. Right? For yeah. something to give, in which case he won and he achieved success because he was released from prison. And so exercising your mind to be able to hold on and not give up yeah. allows you to win any challenge you face. Assuming that, you know, you're 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 kind of doing the right thing. I mean, there's also, you know, you can you can start a business that's just not supposed to work or do whatever. And like your mind, you know, continuing on a path that's gonna lead to failure is not smart either. But yes, to your point. But I you're mean, not gonna but you're not gonna fail because you yeah, pivot. of course, you right. Pivot. You did it. You pivot, you, right? Oh, I think, yeah. yeah, pivot, 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 and suddenly yeah. you end up with something completely different that right. wins. Right, right. But I think to to your first question of like what is difficult about the entrepreneurial journey, um, I mean it's 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 psychology, right? And I think for psychology, it's um, the the fear of the uncertainty. You have no idea whether something's gonna do well or not, right? So you're just going on this path. And for most entrepreneurs, um, you don't have a safety net, right? So you have nothing to fall back on. So this is it. This is the thing that you've embarked on. And not just your financial outcome and financial um, um, kind of stability is tied to it, but your social stability and your social wellness is tied to it as well, because you've pitched to the world that, look, I'm going to do this thing. Please believe in me. And a lot of people may or may not believe in you, but you've, already, you've convinced people that, you know, they should believe in you. And if you fail, you know, that's the thing you're afraid of is people are going to say, well, aha, I told you that you're going to fail. I, I told you this is a stupid idea, right? So you're, it's like, you know, the hardest part about, I think anything that is um, not stable in the future is um, you're asking people to bet on you. Uh, and that's a lot of burden. Um, and you might fail. Failure. Yeah. Exactly failure. Did you see what you just did? Yeah. You just made failure a thing. Yeah. Like, oh my God, like society is going to think I'm in, I'm a fool and I'm going to yeah. fail and what's going to happen. Look at the burden. Look at the way you answered that. Yeah, yeah. An entrepreneur and I went through the same thing. I think the first time I like really made bad decisions and I fell to the ground, I was like, I'm done. Mm. Right. And I will never forget. It was a choice in my head. Should I shut this down or should I keep? Like, should I just keep waking up, literally waking up and showing up? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know what next step to take. No one's taken this step before. I don't know who to go to for guidance. Mm. I said, you know what? Just power through. Let's keep taking a step, taking a step, taking yeah. a step. What that, looking back, and I made more mistakes than I did successes, getting comfortable with failing and failing often, mm. right? Because failure is inevitable, mm. but failure is not final. Yeah, yeah, I, I failure, failure is not. So I, I admire the way you think about it. I, I never, I used to not think about it this way. I'm, I'm training myself to think this way. It's not an easy way to sort of adapt, right? Because to a certain extent, failure is, you know, it's sort of, I think the way I think about it, there's um, expectations and there's reality and the stuff in the middle is 
the stuff of disappointment and happiness, right? The more the more your reality and expectations are matched together, the more content and happier you'll be, the more they're far apart, they're sort of, um, the more disappointed you'll be in yourself and the more failure happens, right? So if you move forward with a mindset that I'm gonna fail, it's inevitable, right? I'm gonna lose some business along the way before I gain business. I'm gonna lose money before I gain money. I'm gonna, people are gonna ridicule me before they admire me. Right. If you move forward with that sort of expectation, chances are you're not going to be disappointing in yourself because you're going to say, well, this is, right. this is what was meant to happen. But moving forward with that mindset of failure is inevitable, but also showing the world that you are a winner because that's a, what the world expects of you are two different sides of you that are competing, right? And sort of keeping them in harmony is what's, I think, very difficult. But I think that that's where you have to change your mindset. Yeah. Forget what the world expects of you. How do you do that? How, how, Fazan, how do you do that? What, what have you done? Uh, this, what, what have you, what have you, what kind of Zen-like experience can you share with your audience that you've these, gone through? These things called... Because I remember uh, five years ago, I've introduced you to two things that I think have made an impact on your life. One is, well, we won't talk about the, the one thing, but it, it's led to this conversation, right? The other thing, which you and I both tried for many years, is meditation. Now, the difference between you and I in meditation is I still like try to meditate here and there. I'm not very good at it. I always want to get better. I need to meditate a bit more. You went on a medica- you went on a meditation podcast. You did medica- meditation for a year. And then you call me back and you said, meditation, did it, nailed it, done, finished. <laughs> I'm a pro at meditation, which is the difference between you and me. You are just like Mr. Marketing, did it, telling everyone about your the, I'm meditation, the, yeah, I'm meditation pro. And I'm still like, well, I need to meditate more. I'm not good enough. <laughs> so um, how have you achieved this Zen-like state? What have you done? I don't know if I've achieved Zen-like state. I just, I think that, Ultimately, as an as someone who wants to build something, right? Forget, forget. It could be a builder. It could be an architect. It could be anyone. Someone who's building something. Mm. First of all, like I said, you need to be sold before you can sell. Yeah. Right. Was I sold in what I was building? Did it come from here? Was there a reason for building it? Mm. You know, what was the reason? Was it? Oh, I want to build something because I want the title of it, mm. right? Or I genuinely want to create something and leave. And that's your purpose. I think it was a recalibration of what is it that I want to build? Let me ask you a question. Do you think people are born with this psychology or do you think it's learned? I think it's learned. And and how does one learn it? I think it starts at a very young age. Okay. I think it's... So if you're an adult and you don't have this psychology within you, then what, game over for you? Or you should should seek safety in doing something that doesn't require this kind of... Em- embracing a failure. Look, I think at the end of the day, my belief, or at least my understanding has evolved. If you are of sound and able mind and body, hmm. right? Obviously not everyone has the perfect gift of sound, able mind and body. Uh, if you have that, yeah. you're already a winner. I mean, yes, Number I, I agree with that. Because I mean, that's yeah. your baseline, right? Yeah. Now with that, your mind needs to be fine-tuned to be, because your mind is the control center for the body. Right. And your soul, which is your energy, your chi, your whatever people want to call it, right? Yeah. The essence, or, you know, ruh, jise kehate, controls the mind. Yeah. What we need to do is take that spirit, control that spirit, and use the spirit to control the mind, which controls the body. Your body will do what you tell it to do. Most people live here. Most people live and under th- their th- body. This controls this and most people live body here. Body controls the mind. Right. The mind does not control weight. No. Uh. You're only feeling hungry because you ate three bags of cookies an hour ago and your sugar is dropped. Yeah. You have enough fat on you to not die. The yeah. brain is not doing that. Yeah. Most people, if they don't eat for 24 hours, they're not going to die. Right. Right? Yeah. Just, keep, just drink water. Maybe not with water. But isn't that your brain telling your body that you're hungry and you're just kind of following your brain? Your body is reacting and telling the brain that it needs food. Right. Right, because your blood sugar has dropped. Yeah. That sends a signal to the brain, blood sugar dropped, dangerously low, put something in to raise blood sugar. 
Yeah. You know, and suddenly you react and you eat your blood. You know, you eat uh, you eat another cook- cookie and then you just keep going. Is that why you have a, a sugar problem? I, that, <laughs> yeah. That's why I have a sugar problem. I yeah. recognize that. Did you did you fix it by the way? Did you? Uh, I control my sugar intake. Yeah. Yeah. I I so, now I mean know. that I mean I would like getting over like a, you know, addiction to sugar and cookies. I I know you have a I love sugar. cookie cookie thing. I have a cookie. Uh, whenever we used to go out for dinner, you would be the guy who would leave with a bag of cookies <laughs> after the dinner. Yeah. Uh, so I know that, but I mean, you control, you learn how to control it because you just found out that it's just a mental thing. It's a mental it thing. So like, for example, if, if I want to have a big meal, I want to eat whatever I want to eat. I'll eat that whatever I want to eat that day. Yeah. The next day I will start with black coffee and I'll enter into a minimum 18 hour fast or I'll go up to 24. Yeah. So now what will happen is if I consume 3000 calories on day one, I go the next day and I do an 18 or 24 hour fast and I just do 500 calories. I've just done 3,500 calories over a 48 hour period. So my calorie count now just got split in half. Hmm. So whereas I overate one day, I underate the next day and I made up for it. So hmm. I want to binge, I binge. Hmm. I then pay the price. It's a price you pay, right? Hmm. It's a ticket. I can't eat the next day. Yeah. But I drink water, I'll drink coffee and it's, it's fantastic for your um, attention for, you know, just just being present. Speaking of attention, I think one of the things that I've uh, been finding difficult um, in recent years is is learning how to manage my energy. Like just my energy throughout the day, how do I stay clear and alert? Uh, I used to, you know, crash in the afternoon, so I stopped drinking coffee. Uh, uh, late into the afternoon, I had trouble sleeping. But that's one thing. But, you know, to your point of like, how do you, how do you maintain the psychology of anything you're doing? Sort of the, uh, you know, the baseline thing is have being in a good state of mind. And I don't mean mind like just your your head. I mean, good he- physical body health, good um, mental health. There's this guy, um, Huberman, uh, you know, who, do, who does a lot of podcasts on, um, on kind of human brain and the psychology of, of how your body works. And um, he talks a lot about, you know, before you're making any big decision, make sure you're in the right state. Right state being like, you know, you've had enough to eat, you've had enough to sleep, you've well rested, you know, you're, you're physically fit, you're in a good mood, whatever it is, you know, the things that we take for granted. And oftentimes the worst decisions, the decisions we make that are the bad decisions are because we just didn't get enough sleep that night, right? And it's sort of when we lash out at people and we react too quickly back to going to Viktor Frankl is like achieving that level of discipline can only come when you achieve kind of the baseline level, sound body, sound mind, right? So like the first thing is like live a healthy life, right? So I've been focusing a lot on that recently. I think you and I have talked about this as well as like, how do you focus on making sure you're getting enough sleep? making sure you're eating right, uh, making sure whatever it is that is, you know, in excess in your life, too much caffeine or whatever, how are you maintaining balance? So I think, look, the whole point about what we started talking about a failure, right? Uh, I think it's linked to this. Yeah. You achieve a state of failure, right? When things stop working mm. and things stop working initially with you. Mm. Because maybe your energy was not managed correctly, mm. right? And so when your energy management is out of sync, you're undernourished, underslept, overstressed, because just, you know, you're building a business, it's stress from everywhere. Mm. Your energy management is out of sync, which means your, uh, your risk of failure increases. Yeah. And so when you are in that situation where the en- energy management is completely lost, you will potentially fail. So one of the things to do to prevent failure, in my view, the easiest thing, forget business model, forget numbers, forecasting, whatever, just be in the right space of energy. Hmm. Like you said, Hmm. when whatever that works for you, you want to cut caffeine, cut caffeine. You don't want to cut caffeine. You know what energy works for you. And I think you have to work backwards. It starts with rest. Yeah. If you need eight hours, you're an eight hour person. You could need six. Whatever your rest state is where you wake up fresh and you can survive the day without caffeine. Mm. That is your, this is my rest. Which is very hard to do. I, I've, I've, uh, I've been drinking coffee since university. Exactly. I've known you. Yeah, since, since. So, but that's the thing, right? Like if you, but, can, if you can figure out that at this level, 
Caffeine. I can get through the day without caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that is my rest requirement. Let's say it's eight hours. Yeah. Now I build everything around that. That becomes the more the core block of my time in the day. Yeah. More important than anything else. Yeah. One and thing I've started doing recently, which has made a big difference in my sort of energy management, is I'll skip coffee for the first two to three hours of the day, which is very difficult to do um, because those are your most productive hours, right? But what that does is it allows your sort of natural cortisol levels to reach a normal state, which is what your body is meant to do, right? It's supposed to actually back in the day, in the caveman days, like people didn't drink coffee first thing in the morning. They went out into the sunlight, they faced danger and fear and their cortisol levels went up. And that's how the body like knew how to wake up and knew how to be alert. Um, not to say that I'm trying to, you know, I'm seeking out danger, but if you just go out and get sunlight first thing in the morning, skip your chai, skip your coffee for a couple hours, you notice your body naturally begins to like wake up on its own, naturally gets alert. And then the coffee ends up, ends up being just an added boost. It's like, you know, the extra layer of sugar that you need, uh, that's just going to give you that little jump and then doesn't let you crash later on. So that's been a big thing uh, for me. So the entrepreneurship journey, fascinating that it is, number one, a mindset and energy management. Yeah. Right. That's, I think, the key. But I think the key to anything, right? I mean, if, if you're doing anything, energy management is, is a big part. Not just entrepreneurship. I mean, and even, you, and parenting, even parenting, writing something, living your, living your normal day-to-day -day life, right? It's sort of what are the things that give you energy and what are the things that drain energy out of you, right? So classic example is like, I am an introvert. Um, for me, one of the difficult, most difficult things about being an entrepreneur is always being on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that drains a lot of energy. So I have to like learn to balance my day yeah. and I block off the morning and say, morning is my time, no meetings, you know, and I have a small chunk of time for meetings. So whatever works for you, right? And I think what people learn to do, what I've learned to do later on in life is like figure out, okay, what are the things that take energy away? What are the things that feed energy? So and there's some people that take energy away and there's yeah. some people yeah, that feed course. energy. So Absolutely. it's not just you. Yeah. It's also the people you surround yourself with. And I think that's where the whole, like one of my key takeaways, like if I was to say, what are the key three takeaways from embarking on an entrepreneurial journey yeah. versus being a corporate, um, I don't want to use the typical word, but I want to use, let's say being a corporate career individual. Yeah. You were, I was going to use a different word, but. But, but what's the word? You're kind of slave. <laughs> but I don't think that's a good word. You don't want to use the word slave. You're not a slave to the corporate system. You are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have a choice. Yeah. But you are now embarking on someone else's journey to assist them. And that's fine. I, I think the difference is you're, you're, you know, you're in a more structured environment. Because it's someone else's journey. It's someone else's direction. Sure. They're leading. You're behind it. Because you're in the shadow, you're protected. Sure. And you are fared a very fair comfortable compensation for that, but you don't have the kind of flexibility they do. All right. So sure. think of someone who is leading a trail, you know, when you're going um, for a trail run or let's right. say you're going hiking, yeah. you know, you're going for a base camp trek. You're, you're, you're following a tried and tested path as opposed to going off on your own and saying, I'm just going to get up to the mountain. And when you go and get off on your own, you might have someone ahead of you who's taking the risk by putting his foot first in the shrub, right. then on the twig, then what seems like moss and his foot goes down. You're watching them. You're, yeah. That's your insurance. Yeah. Because if they mess up, you're protected. Right. So that, yeah. You know what I mean? So we, we did a, a very long explanation of the difference between an entrepreneur and a corporate person. Because like, I, I mean, I used to work a job, right? I mean, I used to... So did I. You did as well. In fact, you've worked a lot of different jobs. Uh, in fact, back to the word of failure, like it's it's quite like you and I. So you know, for your viewers, like I I know the host because we went to university together. Uh, well, I went. I think you were like in and around the area <laughs> while, while classes were happening. I don't think you actually went inside the classroom. <laughs> I saw where they were. You yeah. saw where they were. You used yeah. to walk by. I used to wave at you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would. And yet, I do remember this. You, you somehow managed to convince one of our professors, Econ, right? El yeah. Elsinger. Uh, uh, Burton. Burton. That you were a car enthusiast, which you are. 
And that might give it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the cars, right? The cars give it away. I've, I remember used to play this game where like you would figure out the car and the year and the make by the headlight. Like you would see in a car in the parking lot. We would play this game, <laughs> and you would always you would always be right. How bored were we? We were. We had a lot of free time on our hands. Oh man, that was, those are the good days. Um, Speaking of energy management, back then we had lots of energy, lots of free yeah. time, and we didn't do anything. We never thought that. about energy yeah, management. We didn't. You know, we, that was not an issue or a topic. No, no. Can you imagine us sitting in our twenties being like, yeah. "Let's talk about energy." Let's management. talk about energy management. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, I think, a facet of. But I think that that's what it comes down to, is right. Like, so you're, you're, especially the. Corporate. But Fazan, let me let me close because this is, I think, related to what you're saying about failures that. After university, you and I had very different career paths where I went the very linear path of like, you know, safe path, you know, back to being a corporate person. I went to grad school. I went to law school. I worked in law firm. It's only recently that I started going off mm. on this entrepreneur journey. You well, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You, you <laughs> when we were in college, everyone was like, I want to be a banker. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. You were like, I want to be a CEO. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, cut, cut everything. I just want to be a CEO. But you went from working at... Um, Star- I started with a Burger King. You started at Burger King. I remember my first job. Actually, no. My first job, my first job job was when I was 17. I worked in Standard Chartered Bank in the treasury dealing room as an intern for, I think it was five weeks. Or something. Okay. That's when you wanted to be a banker. That's when I was like, I want this. The yeah. Billions and billions in the fancy life. life. And then, then, then came Burger King. Then you're like, maybe I can, I can sell serve. Burger. <laughs> maybe I should do food service. <laughs> I didn't. I, <laughs> it's like you went through everything. Like you're like, let me try Burger King. I actually remember this because you're like, you used to be so proud of yourself. You're like, you know, for us, a guy came up to me today and commended me on my customer service because when yeah. I serve... Anyone, I do it with a smile. I ask them how their day is going, and this guy commended me. So you knew you. So I learned then. Actually, that was my big takeaway from Burger King. It was the year two thousand. Two thousand, the summer. Day. Summer, yeah. June, June two thousand. Yeah. I wanted to come back and visit friends and family. My parents were like, "No, you're going to stay where we are." Yeah. And I was like, "Okay, I'll go make my money, buy my ticket, and fly." Yeah. So uh, I worked at Burger King because that was the closest thing. Yeah, making what, five dollars an hour. Making seven twenty-five. Seven twenty-five. And I will never forget. There were three instances where customers came up specifically and said, "We've never done this in a fast food joint, but thank you for service." Yeah, I was like that's weird. Yeah, so I was like, maybe, maybe that's a skill. Maybe I'm good with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely am not good alone with research. Yeah, you're not good sitting in a basement by yourself. No, that's something I could do. I would enjoy that, but you you were like, I need yeah. to go out and meet people, and that's that's your that's a skill you have that you. Yeah. So the, and look at how. But you know, the next job after that was very similar. You used to work at Banana Republic. More people. More people, and around fashion and clothes, which you, you you're you're a well dressed guy. Well, uh, yeah, I've given and, that. And we used to come there. And try to get shirts. We used to get try to get clothes for free, and you would give us a discount. But I remember you were very good at folding clothes. That's I, the other skill you have. I, yes, I am You're very extremely. good at folding. Clothes. I'm very quick. Yeah, and I'm very good. So if I'm ever failed as an entrepreneur, yeah, I will be a professional cloth folder with people involved. So that you're yes, and we'll have a team. In fact, we'll do. Pro- yeah. It will be clothes <laughs> folding as a subscription. If 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 you had to decide at the age of 21, like what are your Superpowers, right? Cloth folding. Cloth fold, folding. And, and people. people. Yeah. Yes. One of the other is going to lead to a career. 100%. But after that, you went to go work in a car factory because you convinced one of our professors whose class you never went to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow you were a car genius and he called what the, the CEO of GM at the time. Yeah. The largest, one of the largest car companies in the world. Said you have to meet this guy. I didn't know that favors worked in America. I mean, I didn't. Well, now I know it's a completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were we were young. He's so naive. We were just 21. Yeah. Um, but should I tell you something more about failure now that you're going on this story? Yeah. I have helped pretty much every company that I have worked full time at fail. Not just company, but you've taken institution to a different level. I've actually amplified failure by. Merrill Lynch, I once interned yeah. at, yeah, failed and yeah. does not exist anymore. And then if you if if you really needed to prove your point, because you're like, listen, General, General Mills is fine, General Mills, 
They're more one of the largest companies in the world. Fine, but you know, I really want to make my mark on Wall Street. Let me go to one of the oldest, biggest investment banks in the world, Lehman Brothers. Within a year, done. Within a year, yeah. So <laughs> Merrill Lynch. I mean, you were there bankrupt. the summer they went. General bankrupt. Motors <laughs> bankrupt. Lehman Brothers bankrupt. All three. And Lehman Brothers took you what three months or took you? Eight yeah, years? Lehman Brothers was my so GM took me about four years. Yeah, I worked there from 03 to 07. 07, they went in a no, they went into bankruptcy. I think it was 08 nine nine like after the crisis. Yeah, Lehman, I was there for three months. Three months. Done. At that point, you were pro. You're like I know. Like I can like I can back up to you <laughs> in literally three months. Yeah, you know. So Merrill, GM, Lehman. Yeah, and that is my legacy. <laughs> I mean, I I didn't want to I didn't want to make I was just. Try to, when you said the word failure. So I'm on, and I'm, I'm contrasting that to a very, very. So I'm unhirable. No. <laughs> <laughs> which is why any business that I now do yeah. has to work. Which is, which is why you went on the entrepreneur journey. Because uh, no one else would hire me. <laughs> they were too scared that company would go back. So if, if, if you, if people were to look at your resume, that's, that's what they would say. I think I got comfortable with uncertainty. I think yeah. the most important thing in, in all of this. Yeah is like, I remember when the Lehman bankruptcy thing happened and we were waiting for our offer letters and everything. Everyone went crazy. Oh my God, we've lost our jobs, this, that, the other. I said, look. Look, you're me. like, I'm only 24, but I've actually seen this five times now. <laughs> 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 I, should, like, I actually know how bankruptcy court works. I can, it's, it's guys, don't it's worry. It's fine. It's fine. Right? <laughs> There's a billion dollar building right here. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. You know, so I think I'd gotten comfortable seeing uncertainty. Yeah. That over time, I realized that as, as an entrepreneurship, you just have to be the space between stimulus and response. Yeah. Where there's uncertainty yeah. is a space you need to own and be comfortable with. That is your space of existence. Yeah. And you cannot react in that space. You got to be in Zen state. And whether you achieve Zen through meditation, whether you achieve it by going swimming or running or playing with your kids or reading a book or watching Netflix... Anything that uh, helps you achieve that Zen mm -hmm. so that you can create a bigger space between stimulus and response. I think that is what you need. So that's, and, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's very hard to pull off, right? I think most people that that space is very limited, right? Between stimulus and response company I'm working at is going bankrupt response. I want to freak out. I have to look for another job. Um, you know, a friend, family member, someone, gets angry at you, your immediate reaction is to get angry with that, right? Um, didn't sleep enough, your immediate reaction is to be cranky the next day. Um, so that's very hard to achieve, right? So how do you achieve that? Is it is it meditation? Is it is it being in control of your mind? I think it's about is it practice. And no, I think it's going after just working at one failed company after another and just getting used to it. I mean, what is No, I think it's... Are, are, are more boring, like... To, to our, you know, we're, we've been friends for now 20 years. We've taken very, we're very similar in a lot of ways, but we've taken a very different path to where we are now. We're both, you know, at a place in our lives, but we took very different paths to get here. And I would say like, you and I are different, genetically different, right? I mean, your brain is like, <laughs> in a good way, right? I mean, you do 10 things at once and you do them well, whereas I'm the kind of guy who needs to do one thing methodically do that well before I move on to something else, right? And for me, failure is something that is um, not an intuitive concept, right? I need to learn to be okay with it. For you, it's like failure, fine, I'll move on to the next opportunity, which is just probably why what makes you a seasoned yeah, but I think, entrepreneur. But I think what there's the, the biggest thing in this, I think it is the defeat and the removal of the ego. Yeah. Right? When you, when we talk about stimulus and response. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, so your ego is like, not just you, it's your family, it's your significant other, it's your it's thoughts. kids. Yeah, but these are all thoughts. So the perception. The thoughts are in your mind and you control your mind. And you think that the way they think of you. Is irrelevant. Is, is, or you think it's just all in your head. Like, it's in your head. It's irrelevant. And it is completely irrelevant. And, and that's your ego, right? As long as you are doing what you need to do for your, if you, they are dependents on you. Yeah. 
right? So first of all, I mean, I I, I use family as as the most obvious. It could be anything. So it could, it as could long, be you. It could be social media, LinkedIn. You know, as long as you're not offending your dependents, whether your dependents are your followers on social media, whether your dependents are family members, or whether your dependents are employees who are depending on you for a paycheck. Hmm. As long as you are not offending the people that depend on you, and as long as you are not interrupting that dependency, right? Yeah. Or 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 distract or violating that dependency or you know, sort of uh, disrupting it in that it becomes inconsistent. Like they can't depend on a paycheck or you're not managing your company well, any of those things, right? Yeah. Right? As long as you're not doing any of those things, I think you are fine because then you can detach the ego. Because the ego is just accumulation of thoughts in your mind. A thoughts and experiences over years. Right. Your upbringing, your various stimulus across across the way, the kind of pe- the way people treated you, the way you reacted in college. Well, it's a thousand different things. Mm. When you fail enough, you realize there is no ego. Mm. Right. I had one of the best, most memorable conversations. I was sitting across from here, a famous rally driver, Nader Maxi. Mm. And he talked about ego so beautifully. And he said, you know what, Fazan, when you're racing. So in our rallies, there's a three minute gap between each car. So if I'm driving, I first leave the line. I'm three minutes ahead of the next car that will leave the line. And he goes to me, he's like, Fazan, when you're racing and the guy behind you has caught up and he's flashing you, what are you going to do? He said, most people are going to not let the guy pass them because it hurts their ego. Right? immediately he's like you know what oh my god why am i going to let this guy pass and he's like that's where most of the accidents happen he said you have to appreciate and recognize that that guy just caught up three minutes he's faster than you and if he's standing on your taillights respect him and let him go Mm. and he's like that is how i race i will never ever get in the way Mm. and there's a seasoned race driver Mm. talking about how it is and i asked him i said where do most of the mistakes come he said it's ego when people need to protect their ego Thinking they are this, but they are this. Yeah. It is the gap between expectation and reality. Yeah. You need to eliminate that gap. Right. And when you have eliminated that gap, I think 90%, 99% of what you need to solve for has been taken care of. Well, we were talking about this earlier as well. Like it's also 99% of your uh, disappointment, unhappiness, whatever it is, uh, the feeling of, man, things didn't work out or it's like, you know, this is when, what I expected is the difference between expectation and reality, right? And so the, the more you can kind of bridge that gap and keep your expectations low, the more whenever reality comes in and knocks you out, you're, you're not going to be that surprised, right? So uh, because it's, yeah. there is no gap. You yeah. see, you have to, the gap exists because you believe, you, believe you perceive you believe, right? because of the thoughts and experiences that tell you you are so good or you're this or you're that. You are what the the outcome tells you you are, right? If your business is growing at a 10x potential and you're growing it at that potential, okay, you're good. But there could also be market factors that are pushing you that. Yeah. So you need to be able to accept that it's not just you, it might be 10 other things. Right. Similarly, if your business is not growing at all, right, and you're beating yourself up for it, it might be that that industry, like Bitcoin we just talked about, Bitcoin yeah. was bottoming out. People in the Bitcoin space, if they were like, oh my God, I suck, I messed up, I made a bad investment, blah, blah, blah. What is up with Bitcoin? What is up with Bitcoin? Um, are you asking what is Bitcoin or what's going on the price of Bitcoin? We're gonna, we know what Bitcoin is. Okay, it's yeah, funny money. It's time. funny money. Funny money. It's right. fake. Made it's up. not real. That's right. And it has value. Yeah. And that value seems to be increasing yeah. significantly yep. in the last few days. Yep. Why? We took Econ 201 together, right? I spent most of my time outside that. You actually did really well in Econ 201. I got a D minus in Econ. I was, I was sitting there next to someone very smart. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't me. I failed Econ 201. No, I actually did well in Econ. Overall, I, I, Econ is something that made a lot of sense. Macro Econ, you understood, right? Yeah. Macro, macro Econ, econ I understood. understood. The only thing I remember from Econ is supply and demand. Yes. Uh, so that's what's happening with Bitcoin. No, how are we? Supply is fixed. Supply is fixed, demand is going up. Why is demand going up? So in the US, they approved this thing called an exchange traded fund. What is an exchange? Wait, let me guess. <laughs> is it a fund that is traded on an exchange? It's called an ETF. Wow, that sounds ETF. so cool. Yeah. 
<laughs> it actually sounds better when you call it ETF. Oh, okay. Right? Because Not to what, be confused with ETH, which is ETH, which, which is, is Ethereum, Ethereum, which is a very different kind of uh, cryptocurrency. Yeah. So this is a fund, basically you pull money into it and you list this fund on like the New York Stock Exchange and then you basically buy a share into this fund. So you don't really have to own the currency. Mm -hmm. You can own the share of the fund, but the fund moves with the currency because That's it's right. a pool of the of, of the That's cryptocurrency. Right. Yeah. So like if you're a big investment firm like BlackRock, for example, yeah. you realize that there's a lot of interest in this asset class called Bitcoin. Yeah. So you create an ETF. Yeah. ETF means that it's a public share. It's a public fund that anybody yeah. could buy shares in. It's traded on an exchange. So anyone can buy them. Anybody, anybody can buy it. So what basically the ETF did is it, it opened up this Bitcoin. Now anybody can buy Bitcoin, right? You can go on yeah. Coinbase or any one of yeah. these funds. Um, exchanges and buy Bitcoin, but you know the average investor doesn't know how to open up a Coinbase account, doesn't know what it is. But if it's an ETF, somehow it just seems safer because they've been buying stocks. For yeah, a they've, been buying stocks, they've, they've been buying stocks. They're investing in mutual funds. It's backed by a huge yeah. company like BlackRock or a few other companies. It's been approved now by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a primary. So you're uh, buying into that trust that an ETF brings because the big guys are backing it that you've heard of for the last, let's say, decade, two right. decades, that's three right. decades. But this is Bitcoin, which is something brand new. Right. But you're buying the exact same thing, right? You're rather than buying the thing directly, you're buying shares in something that owns that. Would thing. you have to pay a premium to the middleman? I mean, there is a you end up You end up paying a, a, a small fee yeah. to the middleman, which is BlackRock. Um, so you end up paying that. But for the average investor who doesn't want to open up an account, like that fee is negligible, right? So then is that, so because of this ETF, the prices went up of Bitcoin because people assume or they're pricing it in that more demand will exist in the near future? So it's supply and demand, right? So the supply is fixed. There's a certain amount of Bitcoin out there, um, and which is why people think it's, it's sound currency, right? The supply is never going to go up. There's no such thing as inflation in Bitcoin, unlike, you know, Crumb, inflation yeah, in paper any other currency you which you can print at any point. So the supply is fixed and demand goes up, price is naturally going to go up. Price went up right now because, um, you know, it's sort of the ETF has opened uh, the the asset class up to more investors. Right. So in order for companies like BlackRock to maintain that ETF, they have to buy more Bitcoin, right? So they're eating into some of that supply. So the supply is getting less, price is going up. There are other factors involved as well, which is like the macro factors in the U.S. Um, you know, uh, inflation is going down. People think the economy is not going to go into recession. So generally, most assets in the U.S. are going up in terms of price. So the asset class is going up. Everything is going up. ETFs back in. So it's a good time to buy. But you don't make investment recommendations. Any <laughs> recommendations. Don't make it. Uh, crypto, it's, it's interesting because um, if you're buying it because you believe the price is going to go up, I mean, I think the price is going to go up. But... You also have to believe in the fundamentals of Bitcoin to believe, you know, if you're going to buy anything, I think you have to believe, you have to have certain belief in the asset class. Right? Yeah. So if you're you not believe in the asset class, don't play with it. That's my personal view. I think whenever you buy any kind, whenever you make any kind of investment, you should believe in that investment. Yeah. Whether it's real estate, stocks, something, whatever it is, that is your investment. You should believe, you should have some thesis behind it, right? Otherwise you're a trader and at least you and I are not smart enough to be traders. I Maybe definitely need some out enough. there who are. I'm going to stick to my asset class, yeah. which is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So basically, so so now, if if let's say looking at the end of 2024, yeah, do you think that you see more ETFs coming to market? Uh, for Bitcoin, yes. Uh, there, there's a and they'd be all coin specific. Or could there be a clubbed ETF that is a mixed coin ETF? So the, the, the other ETF that people are speculating will come out will be one for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethereum is another cryptocurrency. Uh, we talked about, I think, the last time we spoke, the difference between Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Bitcoin is like the dollar, mm. right? It's a currency that the only value it has is just an exchange of value between people. Ethereum is like the internet. Right, it's an operating system on which you can build other cryptocurrencies. Right, so it's like you know you have a stake yeah. in the internet, or you have a stake in a currency like the dollar. Got it. Right. Um, so the other thing people are betting on is an ETF coming out for Ethereum. Ethereum is a second sort of 
most valued cryptocurrency in the market. It's about a third of the value of Bitcoin. So if that comes out, then obviously the price of Ethereum is also going to go up that, and Bitcoin and Ethereum tend to be correlated in price. So one goes up, the other naturally goes up. Right. Uh, so, so the questions that I saw on the internet, like I think about a year ago, six months ago, well, before it, it bottomed out, $100,000 Bitcoin. Yeah. Is 2024 the year of the $100,000 Bitcoin? So I think the last high was what, 80,000? 60 something. 60,000. 66. Uh, That's when I bought it. Yeah. <laughs> I think, did I tell you to buy it? I did. Yeah, you did. I told you to buy it less yeah, than you, that. You told, me it, you told me it's 65, right? Yeah. When I bought it, it was 66. And I've only seen it at 16 since then. Yeah. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I didn't sell mine either. So I've, been, I've gone down with you. So it was, look, I think it's inherent. I think in hindsight, um, so for high achievers, when they fail, yeah, I think it's just, again, being comfortable with failure, knowing that it's a part of the experience. You know, failure is not the defining moment. Yeah. You will you will fail. And you will fail and you will fail and you will fail. And exactly. how do you reframe that word failure in your mind? So okay, you I'll fail, give you an example. Right? You I'll give you an example. Just last week I was teaching my seven year old how to ride a bike. Hmm. I told her when she got off the bike, I when she got on the bike, I said, Today you will have no trading wheels. It will take you about an hour, maybe it'll take you two. But today you will take off your trading wheels. Hmm. I said, now except that you might fall a couple of times. Mm. I told her this up front. You will fall a couple of times, that's okay. I'm standing right here to pick you up. Mm. And we went with that mindset. Mm. Now she's expecting, she knows she's going to fall. Mm. She knows she's learning, yeah. she's going to fall. Falling is not, a, oh shit, I fell, I can't ride a bike. Yeah. I told her, you will fall, you will fall more than once, just pick yourself up. And I didn't help her. When yeah. she would fall, I mean, obviously it was low speeds, it was easy, nothing major happened. But when she would fall, she'd look at me and be like, you're amazing. Pick it up. Let's go. Yeah. When as an entrepreneur, we need that one person doing that for us. Or, or that's the mindset you wake up with in the morning, right? So I, and you don't need a person. So that's what I wanted to come into, right? You, you need that. You need a person. You need a voice. There is no one who will do that for you. Right. You have to do it for yourself. Yeah. And that's where you, at the start of this, you said the books, where the books come from. I didn't know how to do this for myself. No one taught me how to do this for myself. So I turned to reading and I turned to reading about- Which I, I, I smile because I, I do, I, yeah, you, you've read a lot of books recently and you always- And I read about other people who built great businesses. Yeah. And I wanted to understand how they did it. Right. And when I read how they did it, they were ordinary people who built something extraordinary because they truly were sold on that. They believed in it. But yeah, they believed in it, but they were also not afraid of, of failure, right? If so, you don't know that, they will never accept it in their autobiography. I but mean, they, yeah. But they may have been afraid, but they overcome yeah. failure. Right. Whether there was fear attached to it or not. But, but to your point of, you know, um, being okay with failure for the, you know, for for everyone, I think for you know a person who goes into work every day, a person who's trying to start a new company, a person who's raising a family, whatever it is, a failure part. I think what you're saying is basically you have to wake up every day and say I will fail, right? What, there's a, a famous um, line by some someone said, you know, the the hardest part about being a boxer is not being fit or being fast. The hardest part is the fear of getting hit, right? And once you overcome that fear, because getting hit is not that bad. People do get hit and people survive, but it's the fear of getting hit that makes people very uh, timid when they move. It makes them tight, right? And so it's that's- It's the same thing in racing. Yeah. The hardest thing about racing is the fear of rolling over or having a crash. Right. Right? Which is why like when, I mean, you know, a lot of, I feel this way. I do my best when I have nothing to lose. Like when I have like, at the very bottom or when I've just, you know, stopped thinking when this is stopped, um, then I'm like, I've, I've got, I'm going to. That's flow state. That flow state where you just have absolutely nothing to lose. So, so how but, do you wake up in the morning and just say, and that flow state is like, I will lose today. I will fail today. And I've got nothing but gain here. That's a very difficult place to be. But that's where energy management comes into place. That's where it all ties back that if you wake up with rest and you're able to control your thoughts and you tell them, you start your day by saying, I will do my best. Mm. I most likely may fail. Yeah. But as long as I have dusted myself off and I'm ready for tomorrow, I'm good to go. So the key to success is getting eight hours of sleep. Key to success is eight hours of sleep and <laughs> just waking up. And I want to leave you with one last thought. Yeah. Like this thought recently kind of 
formed in my head. It made sense. This whole this whole concept of compounding interest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Compounding interest is a very simple math problem, right? I put in a thousand rupees today into a savings account. My interest rate is at twenty two percent. Next year I'll have one thousand twenty two. The next year after that I'll have let's say one thousand forty five. And it'll be 22 rupee increments. Uh, sorry, my kya kya rao? 22%. It'll be 12.22. It'll be 14.45. Mm. Right? It'll still keep increasing. Mm. Over the next five years, that 1,000 rupees might become maybe 1,800 rupees. Mm. But if I look at it from a 30-year horizon, that 1,000 rupees might become a million rupees. Mm. Right? Mm. But guess where most of the gains took place? In year 27, 28, and 29, and 30, the last four years is where you created the biggest amount of wealth mm. on that interest rate because it's a hockey stick. Yeah. Right? That's what compounding interest is. Yeah. Right? It is basically where interest starts to reap the results, bear the fruits towards the end of its time horizon. Yeah. Guess what? The same applies to everything you do in life. Yeah. Whether you want to train for sports, whether you want to read books, whether you want to be a parent, whether you want to do a podcast, whether you want to be an entrepreneur and run a business, your first few few years, the returns are not compounding well. Right. You have to stay on for as long as possible. Yeah. And what happens with most people in the first four, five, six, seven years, they they see these little increments coming in. And after a while, they just burn out and they're like, I can't do it. Hmm. Because they've not managed their energy. They've not managed their expectations. They've, they've gone to, I mean, um, you're a runner, right? I mean, we've, you've done... You cap out. Well, if you, if you run too fast, you know, the first thing they tell you when you're running a marathon is... You can't run too fast. You, you can't run too fast at the beginning. Yes. Right? It's like your initial instinct is to run because you're full of adrenaline. And there's so many people running with you. So many people running with you and you want to follow them and you want to run really fast at the beginning. And they tell you, first, the first thing you have to do is mentally you have to tell yourself, I'm not going to run fast. I'm going to run slow. So that, to your point, you know, what, and I think the other same point you're trying to make is the key to all this is consistency, right? Every day, wake Every up, show up, wake day, up, show wake up, wake up, 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 show up. Even if you do five minutes or whatever it is you're trying to improve on. That's it. Five minutes. If you do that every single day. The result. Years and years after years, the results will begin to show up. Because Absolutely. Time. And I think what we've done is a lot of people, media, yeah. And the, the big unicorns and cheap money, yeah. uh, low interest rates, the, the concept of VCs, you know, private equity funding, all of this, basically cheap money, cheap, easy money that has appeared in the last 25, 30 years yeah. has skewed the traditional model of business. Right. There are fewer unicorns, but they're far more small, medium enterprises, mm. right? They're probably huge numbers of people with five or $10 million that are living absolutely great lives with successful businesses. Mm. And there are very few unicorns. Mm. So why do you want to be a unicorn and chase for that when you can live a perfectly happy life with something that is a reasonable size business that took you your lifetime to build that as a right. purpose? So yeah. what I want to leave the thought with is compounding applies to business, not just finance. Or life, right? Com I mean, Compounding applies to everything. In life. Everything. And, and so if we wake up and show up, Mm. The results will be there towards the tail end. We mm. just have to be patient to be able to reach that point. And be consistent enough to do to it. To be able to reach that. To reach that point. Do it every single day. Even if it's five minutes a day, show That's up. That's right. Stick with it. And then eventually it, it That's it. it.